get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Gigi Godwin. I'm president and CEO of the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today uh, for our virtual business accelerator. Uh, and our topic, sales to the power of story in a virtual world, how to create an exceptional online experience for your prospects and customers. Through a lively and insightful program, Ira Koretsky will have you thinking deliberately about how to deliver stories as solutions to business problems and on how you can create an exceptional experience in your online meetings. So the key learning benefits of today's program are, well, for example, today you start training your brain to think of stories as solutions to business problems, which then helps you connect faster and more deeply with your prospects and customers. And to create those powerful stories, today you'll learn how to turn ordinary life experiences into those powerful and engaging stories. Why? Because using authentic stories accelerates the development of trust with anyone you are communicating with, especially your prospects and customers. If you'd like to have the slides uh, and audio from today's webinar, uh, we encourage you to reach out directly to our speaker, Ira Koretsky, uh, and he'll make them available to you. So now to introduce Ira. Uh, it is truly a pleasure to introduce Ira Koretsky, CEO and founder of The Chief Storyteller. He was a U.S. Army captain in the Medical Service Corps, serving as both a public affairs officer and chief information officer in the military health system. He designed presentations for himself and over 40 military and civilian executives in technology and healthcare. At just 20 years of age, Ira gained invaluable experience and insights into messaging, communications, and storytelling. Ira has held various leadership roles in marketing and product management. After earning his MBA from the University of Maryland, Robert H. Smith School of Business, go Terps. I'm sure we have other Terps on the call today too. Ira entered into the world of leading edge technology in the San Francisco and Silicon Valley areas. It is there Ira Koretsky started the Chief Storyteller in 20, 2002. My goodness, where did the time go? Today, Ira Koretsky improves your individual and organizational performance through better communication. For over 25 years, Ira has been a global speaker, blogger, in-demand trainer, executive coach in communications, public speaking, and storytelling. He's, he has over 40 articles published. He has accelerated success for fast-growing companies to Fortune 50 corporations, nonprofits, charities, government agencies around the world. Ira Koreski has inspired over 36,000 people from nearly a dozen countries. As you can see, you are in very good hands today. So with that, I will now turn over today's Accelerator program to Ira Koreski. Ira. Thank you, Gigi. All right, if you recall from the description, today is part one of two. So Gigi um, talked about what today is all about and what part two is gonna be about is if you recall, it's gonna be a very hands-on practice. So today is gonna be a little bit of hands-on, but more of the mechanics, the how, and then part two, uh, a lot of part of April, you'll have a chance to actually put into practice what you're doing today, focusing on better public speaking for the story that you're gonna be developing and thinking about from today going forward. We're gonna break it down in these five key areas, or actually four key areas, and then suggestions for you for next steps. And the sales playbook is something that I recommend every organization have, uh, and, and specific, you can have a shorter one, you can have a longer one, and I'll kind of give you some suggestions for that as well. All right, so let's use Zoom to our advantage today. So be honest, raise your hand, who's already multitasking? All right, I see, Fari, thank you for being honest. I appreciate that, All right? We're used to it, right? Most times when I do presentations on webinars, unless it's a very small group. Uh, thank you, Matt. Jenny, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. I hope you guys are smiling, right? There's no, there's no big brother here. But what do we do? We got people busy and we're used to it, right? I caught my daughter this morning um, at the kitchen in the refrigerator 
doing something. And I heard the teacher talking and I said, what are you doing? And she immediately ran back to her desk. Right. So you guys are adults, so you don't have to worry about that. But how do you keep someone's attention? It's very hard because what's happening is we have a, a, a battle. Really, I really think it's a battle against human behavior. And it's not natural for us to stare. I mean, think about it. If you're going to really do a webinar properly, you have to take your eyes and stare at the camera mm -hmm. the entire time. Whereas you have faces, you want to connect with people. That's what human behavior is, is this magnetism, this craving of human connection. And with COVID even more so, because I can't go to the, my favorite chamber in the whole world, right? Montgomery County, well, who I've been a member, I think, since about 2005, 2006, for, so for a long time, longest running relationship that I have as a professional yeah. is the Montgomery County Chamber. And if I was in the room, you'd be paying attention to me. You might grab your phone, but not. So here's some interesting some statistics that came out from Intercall a few years ago. I'll let you read that. This is what people are doing. And you can substitute the word webinar for conference call. It's the same thing. We don't get to see you. I love the, I love the last one of the last ones, exercising. I thought that was hilarious. How do you exercise and be on a conference call? And I'm not talking about like moving your toes. I mean, really exercising, jumping jacks or doing whatever. I mean, I thought that was fascinating. And I thought uh, Professor O'Reilly really summed it up nicely. I read this in Training Magazine. I love this, this way that he looks at it, right? It's about people and human behavior. That's what your job as a facilitator and a presenter in a webinar or a sales meeting, especially a sales meeting. And if people are turning their videos off, what do you do? Nowadays, you can usually say to someone, hey, Alexis, I don't see you. Is everything okay with your camera? And that's usually the prompt to say, okay, time to turn your camera on. But in the beginning of COVID, I remember I was on a sales call and probably, let's see, there were about six executives in the room and half had their cameras on, half didn't. I can't say, hey, turn on your camera, Gigi. I just can't do that. Nowadays, you probably could get away with it, but it depends. It's, it's, it's almost like you're breaking that fourth wall in the movies or TV. So we have to think about human behavior and how do we do this? And so there's, I think, two ways to think about it from your mind. And I want you to think about this when you're engaging prospecting customers online, you're inviting them to participate. And then you want to challenge them to think differently. And that differently and deliberateness to it is what you have to offer. It's your value. Okay, so there's two balancing acts that you're doing throughout the entire virtual experience. Inviting them, engaging them, you can use whatever words that you want in there. Then I'm gonna challenge you to think differently. Let me share with you a little bit about me more than what Gigi shared. She did mention I was in the army. Here I am in 1989 as a first lieutenant. That was just a couple of years ago. Chuckles if I was in the room. <laughs> or Sam Houston, if any of you are familiar with that in the army, that's where all medical professionals. So I was in the administration part. So whether you were a nurse, a lab professional, a radiologist, it didn't matter. Everybody spent time at Fort Sam Houston. And if you were there in the summer, like I was, you, it was so hot and humid, you would sweat in the shower. Gigi did not read this and I appreciate it because I tell them not to read my entire bio. I did improv professionally, like Whose Line Is It Anyway, about a thousand shows, both here in the DC area and in California. This is when I was in California in San Jose. I don't remember the third guy's name, but there I am on stage. And then because of improv, you know how you say there's B movie actors and C movie actors, and you may even say a D lister. I think I was an E lister. This is me doing a inside arena soccer commercial for the Linksys router. 300 bucks for the whole day. It was a fabulous experience. And only my students get to see this. I will never show this online. Maybe when I get really rich and famous, maybe. And speaking of students, Gigi mentioned this. Here's my last in-class uh, picture. I teach twice, 9.30 and 11. And I teach public speaking and storytelling at the business school where I, as Gigi mentioned, I did my MBA. And I'm looking forward to seeing all the students in the fall. And a little bit about me and my company. Gigi mentioned 36,000 from 10 countries, and then if you add US, 11 countries. I've done consulting in across 35 plus industries in the US and four countries. You can't see all of them because some of the countries are a little small in terms of the dots and the colors. And then what I thought was interesting was because of the wonderfulness of the places that I have lived, especially in the Washington DC area and California, all the purple 
represents different ethnicities and regions around the world that I've got exposed to and got to make myself smarter and more appreciative about the world and what it has to offer. And then the last part about uh, personal is I've always been a photographer. Those of you that know me, I would take four to 6,000 photos in a week if I was on vacation. We were in Alaska last year. I took 8,000 photos in 12 days. Uh, I have no problem taking photos. The bad problem is coming back and looking at all of them. So this I took over the weekend. If you're local, this is Green Spring in Annandale. And this is a spring star flower. And then this is something I don't remember when I took this one. This is called metallic green sweat bean. I just love this. And this is what is called macro or close-up photography. So if you're into that, let me know. I need a photography date. My family does not have the patience that I do. All right. Now, I want you to kind of stop for a moment. I shared with you the beginning, very typical, right? I want you to think parallel. This is where we're going to think about online and virtual. I open differently. Most people would start with what? A logo slide or about us company slide. I started with a little tongue in cheek question that inspired some deliberate thinking, right? Some of you smiled and some of you are completely honest. And I appreciate that. I saw a couple of hands. I don't see everybody's hands when you raise them. I shared a quote, something that's also different. And I invited and I challenged you. I told my story pretty quickly, but I showed pictures. Don't be afraid to show pictures, especially today. We as human beings with COVID, we are craving human connection more so than everything. And I think that's part of the reason people are doing the things that are doing. they're doing because it's like NIMBY. If you've ever heard of that, not in my backyard, it's like, oh, I'm not going to get sick. Oh, it's just for whatever reason. It's not right or wrong. It's for whatever reason. I mean, I'm craving it myself. Right? Credibility and capability. So I told my story and I slowly moved in to the world um, chart. And I humanized my presentation and also used a lot of slides. That's another recommendation. So here's a way to think about this. And also keep in mind, you're welcome to take a photo if you want off your phone. And I'm happy to provide a PDF and I'll show you how in, in a, at the end of the presentation. So I'm not going to read all of these. Take a moment to look at them. I'll highlight a couple of them after you read. So WPM on the fourth one down means words per minute. So natural speaking pace is 150 to 175 words per minute. We have to be relevant really quickly nowadays. You've got to get to the point and grab their attention. You're not in control. That's the one that's in quotes. You've lost pretty much all control because most people will default to turning their videos off. I was on a, on a kickoff meeting yesterday with a new company that I'm doing consulting for for the next year. And there was a dog barking and there's nothing I could do about it. I had to smile and tell my dog story. So we got through that. The dog was quiet and we moved on. I mean, things are very, very different. Thought leadership in person, it's part of demonstrating things. Online, it's harder. It's much, much harder. People don't practice. And I really strongly recommend you practice more than ever online, especially if you're doing a first call. It's too many times, right? I've been doing this. It's funny, Gigi said, where the time's gone. I started in 2002. I'm almost 56. And I thought I've seen it all. And people pitch me. I had this one uh, demonstration software. And the guy didn't even mention my company name once in the call. Not once did he personalize the call. Why do I want to do business with him or his company when he shows me he doesn't care? So what are you doing to differentiate? What are you doing to challenge? What homework are you doing? What pre-research are you doing? And then the last part, what stories are you telling to connect people, to invite them into your presentation so they feel like they're part of your presentation? I'm going to show you the Great Stories Framework. It's an online tool. It's free to use. It's on my website. Happy to share with you the PDF of today. And just in case you didn't hear that, the presentation is being recorded. All right, so here's uh, an exercise that I want you to do completely on your own, not in any groups. I want you to think as a business owner or a sales professional, I'm assuming that's the two types of people that we have on the call. What's your best success story or past performance? If you're a brand new company, substitute founder story for today. What prompted you to start your business? Can you tell it now? If I asked you to raise your hand, could you tell it right now? And those of you that are more experienced and have a company that's been around, does it inspire people to get them to say, hey, tell me more, or let's talk, 
let's schedule a demonstration. Talk to me about your process, whatever it might be. So let me give you a couple of minutes. Write down some of your key talking points. What's the business message that you want to share with your prospect or customer? And then lastly, when you're wrapping up your story, what is your call to action? Wrap up, please, wherever you are. It's not about being perfect. It's just about starting to record this. I find that most people do not have their success stories recorded in any way, whether that's in a PDF, a PowerPoint, a proposal. And usually the proposals, when they're written down, are very factual. They don't have any messages, almost exclusively, very few messages in there. All right, Alexis, do you have a, a volunteer, please? At the key talking point I like to talk about it, it's we provide the language service. We provide for the court system, the you know, law firm, profit and nonprofit organization. I started with 15 language. Right now we provide 138 languages. And uh, I um, the, the key talking to the uh, client is we guarantee quality of the service. It's a free of the charge if you have any objection about the quality of the service. And then, um, and also they can reach us Anytime, if they need the interpreter, they can reach it 24 seven at anywhere, anytime. Okay, can I, here's what I'd like you to do. Sure. I want you to tell the story from your heart a little bit. What, what year did you start your, your business? 2010, I started, I opened LLC 2010, but it took two years to start up. 2012, I get the client. All right. So around 2008, 2009, something in your head said, I want to do something differently, correct? Um, actually, okay. Um, entire my life, I want to have my own business. But uh, I was trying to go to different industry, but it didn't happen. I'm a very spiritual person. I connect myself with the universe. I'm asking my higher self, guide me and help me what direction. I have a BA in translation from University of Shiraz in Iran. But then, um, and that the route get open to be uh, open the, the translation services. And therefore I opened the LLC. And when I opened LLC in 2010, I was in a government contractor. I was the you know, operations manager, not doing translation service, but completely different. I'm more in the marketing, sales, and uh, management part. Okay. And Hold on a second. Let me ask sure. you a question. How old were you when you first had a thought that said, I want to own my own business? I think I was in, be honest with you, I think I was late 38. Late 30s? 30s, yes, 40, 40. Okay. What was it about owning your own business? What, what attracted you to thinking, I want to own my own business? Everybody around me, they asked me, you are, you are doing great. Why are you not opening your own business? Why are you not doing? I was at that time, I was working for Elizabeth Arden Red Door Spa, and I was a regional manager for them. And I had the best record. I became between 6,000 people. I became the best employee. I became the best trainer. I became the best, you know, everything. In the, and I, my department, my region, for four years on the road, they had a zero complaint. Okay, hold on, hold on. But you're not telling me what made it so that you wanted to own your own business. You're telling me wonderful things. I, these are nice things but you haven't told me why you want to own your, so say, for example, for me, I started my business because I was laid off. I had no choice, right? This was 2000, yes. right, right after 9-11. And my friends um, were smart. Hold on one second. My friends said you were smart, but I didn't know that why I started my business. It took me two years to realize my goal is to help other people become their own chief storytellers. That's, I never wanted to start my own business. I just knew I wanted to help people. So what is it in your heart or your head that caused you to say, I'm willing to take a big risk and go out on my own because you left a stable job? Um, 2013, 
after 13 years, in 2008, after 13 years working for the one company for Elizabeth Arden, they told me, you have to move to Stanford or, uh, you know, no other choice. I decided, I told them, thank you. With the agreement, I came out. And then I became contractor. As a contractor, when your task is done, they said, thank you, shake your hand and go. Right. And then I told myself, this is it. I'm not going to do it anymore. That was a good experience with the corporation, good experience for government contractor. I want to have my own business because even I make the minimum, at least is rewarding to myself. That's why I said, I'm tired to sending resume. I'm tired to go looking for the job for the next contract. So you wanted to control your own business destiny? Yes. Okay. That's what we want to hear. Okay. Okay. So in 2008, I was made an offer to move to a whole nother state. I didn't want to. I didn't want to move. It was a great experience. Unfortunately, we're moving. And at that time, being at the age that I was and the years of experience that I had, I felt that I wanted to control my destiny. And I realized one of my greatest strengths is working with people, not being from here. I understand the challenges of translation and interpretation. I have a wonderful network of professionals around the world. And I grew the business to where we are today, where we now have 138 different languages that we can support 24 by seven. So that's just a little bit of how you connect personal to business. Does that make sense? Yes, but honestly, I never, I cut the personal. When it comes talking to business, I never talk about the past in my personal. Most people don't. But let's be honest. Don't pretty much everybody want to know where you're from with your accent? I don't. No, I don't have any problem. I'm very proud of to say. No, 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 no. It's not a problem. But don't people ask you, where is your accent Sometimes, from? Yeah, they do. They right. Do. Yeah. So by not adding anything personal at all. It's like your language, your accent is the elephant in the room metaphor. <laughs> yes. With my heavy accent, yes. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to get rid of your accent. So no. embrace it. So yeah. embrace it. Say my accent's Texas. It's a Texas accent with a little drawl. Because so everybody on the call, think about, and I would strongly encourage you to share something personal. That's how you're going to be different. I've done two presentations for Alcus, the Association of Language Companies, Right. There are many that say they do a lot of great languages and say everything that you said. Why am I going to pick you? I'm going to pick you because of you. Because the connection. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you just sound like a sales commercial, which is the way you started, and there's nothing wrong with that, then you sound like all the other translators and interpreter services that we have. Right. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thank, thank you. you. These are and Fari, thank you for volunteering. This is what I would thank be you. doing with whomever was my client, coaching, consulting. This is the same first call that we would have. We would be doing this kind of, of work. All right. So I want you thank to you. imagine now that you're Steve. All right. Steve and I used to work together at a government consulting firm. It did program management for the government. And I worked there for five years back in um, 90, what was it, 93 to 99. And then I started my business uh, a couple of years later, uh, 2002. And Steve uh, knew that I started my own business. And he said to me, um, these are my challenges. And we got a great company, great bunch of people, but we're having problems. We're not problems. We're having challenges that we're not growing. And he called it a problem. And it's not really a problem when you're a successful company, just not growing the way he wanted to. And these are some of the issues that I am sure mo most of you have, if not all five, all five. And this is his cover page for his presentation. This is the sales presentation that he would walk into with prospects that were SESers in the federal government, senior executives. There is zero message on here. There is a zero reason for you not to multitask, right? If you saw this up on the webinar cover page waiting for us to start, you'd be grabbing your phone going, okay, I'll wait. You're not interested. Now I did strip off the name because they asked me to keep their name anonymous. So that was the top left where you kind of see none of the pictures. The bottom left is where they had their message. Interesting, right? And then they call it business even though they were a government contractor. 
So you have the challenges that I mentioned, and then we spent time just like I did with Fari, except that it was with 15 different people in two different meetings, the directors and then the senior leaders. And message maps, that's figuring out what the right messages are. So for you, Fari, for example, you might have a different message for, let's say, a medical focus, like an FDA type contract, as opposed to, say, something that was a Department of Defense. You might have a slightly different message because they have a different mission. You want to match that. But you should have one key message that is your better tomorrow message. That's the bottom. That's for your overall. So if I visit your website, What's your key message? If I visit your LinkedIn profile, you can only put one message in your professional headline. So working with the executives and the directors came up with this metaphor-based story, this safe journey. And we spent, actually Steve spent most of the time looking for these powerful sets of imagery. What does your cover page look like? What messages are you sharing in your sales presentations? And you'll notice that there's this climbing rope. So everywhere, Steve's company is talking about journeying together. They're not focusing on technology. That's their expertise. They're focusing on the experience you're going to get. It's about guiding, receiving above and beyond customer service, simplistic graphics and visuals. If you're not a mountain climber like I was, I'm not, um, and during this meeting, I would have thought, and if I were to pull you in the room, and I would say to you, who thinks the best spot is when you hit the top of the mountain? Everybody would go, yay, you get to take pictures, exhilarating, blah, blah, blah. But that is not the place to end. You're not safe at the top. You could run out of food, run out of air, run out of water, whatever it might be. The safe spot is not base camp B. It's the parking lot C. It's the trip to the top and to the bottom is where you want to go. And so they change the way they communicate. And it's a journey together. And these are their four services that they offer. Here's their call to action. Now, I'm not giving you the whole presentation. I'm just highlighting a couple of the key slides. So we have a metaphor-based story. And it goes through their entire, what I call, system of credibility. Every single touch point that a prospect, customer, a prime, a sub, a government contractor, whomever it is, uh, it's also prospective employees can touch them. It's all synchronized. And because of this new way of communicating, they want a multi, I think it was a four year, and it's certainly, I remember the total, $94 million project with the federal government. Why were they successful? A, they were different. And B, more importantly, they were solving a problem. That's the key to storytelling, ladies and gentlemen. It is not to make someone smile. It is to solve a problem. So I have about 30 different uh, pillars that I have just for storytelling and probably like another 20 for presentations. But these are the ones and I'll share with you a couple of them for the pillars. Number two, a story that you tell in the workplace must inspire us to action, us being your prospect. Another quick story. World in e-commerce, Mark went to my presentation on storytelling for sales and he had this epiphany when he was realizing what his challenge was. Same exact things, a little bit different in the sense that he was consultative sales. Everybody wants to be a good person and share their knowledge, but he wasn't getting to the heart of their problems. And he was just more of a fact and figures kind of presentation. And he had that aha moment when he was in the workshop. So we worked together. I spent time with him. We developed this story playbook, the story library, whatever you want to call it. We had better tomorrow messages, 20% fairly quickly increase of revenue. And after two years, which is about two or three months, I can't remember, uh, I asked Mark what his new number is, 80% after two years. Because now, if you remember back to Professor O'Reilly, we're talking about habits and human behavior. Mark now thinks in terms of storytelling. Okay, you want to change the way that you're thinking. So pillar number four is aligning your stories, actually your messages, your story, your system of credibility to your stakeholder problems. Alexis, let me know if we have any questions. I'm happy to answer them. I don't see any chat box opening, but if you guys want to answer, ask questions as I'm going along, feel free. Just plug them in there and Alexis will uh, let me know. All right, so let's talk about the story playbook. I love this, found this years ago. It's from 1950s. And to me, it encapsulates 
what we're up against today, especially if you didn't know this research, I've read different research out there, but generally speaking, a prospect does about 80% of their research before they contact you. They already know what color it is. They already know what they want. They're going to figure out, are you the best value overall? Are you a right culture fit? Are you the best price? Do I like your business model? Do I like your mission? There's a lot of things that the internet can share with us. But you have to prove to them. And online and virtually, if you remember back to that table, all the things that you're battling, it's hard. If somebody, I mean, I have a client that is a, a VP at a Fortune 50 company, and we had our Monday morning meeting, we're doing our coaching call, and I saw the color of the screen change, and he stopped paying attention to me, and he was reading his email, probably one of his either important customers or his boss sent him an email, and I just paused. He didn't even know I waited, and then he looked back up. I knew he was ready, and I continued. Are you in tune with who's on the call? Are you showing and demonstrating research? Really, really important. So I want you in the chat box, Alexis, if you would just read off for me. All I want you to do is answer this question with a yes or no. And it's not, do you have a sales book? It's do you follow it? And now you can make it super complicated. You can, you could also make it fairly easy. And I would start with easy. Just start. That's the whole key to this is create a system. And here's just a suggestion for some of the key things that I think should be in your set. And there's way more that goes into the sales playbook, way more. It could be very, very complicated. Not complicated, but it could be uh, very dense and have a lot of great information. It just depends on how mature and how sophisticated you want to make your system. The difference between the blue and the green rows, if you can see that in the color distinguished, is at the top, the passive, the blue, is things are things that the customer, the prospect, is doing his uh, or by themselves on his or her own. So they don't need you to walk them through your website, your LinkedIn, your YouTube videos. And then when they become a customer, you're asking them for testimonies, referrals, case studies. That's what you're doing. Now, in the green are things that you're doing actively to engage your prospects and your customers. So if you're going to focus, you need to figure out what, it, what your clients, your customers are going for. Like if you have a website page, for example, your team photo and your about us section, and if you have a executive bio on your website, most likely... Those will be your top three, certainly top five most visited website pages is because people want to know who you are and they want to see themselves in your photo and in your story. They want to know that you resonate. So you need to figure out what's going to be the most important for you. There is no order. There is no priority here for you. You have to figure out what works best. In terms of where their weight of where storytelling would have the most or the best influence and the opportunity to have the best impact for you would be where I start and bold. So think about how today, and this is one of my action items for you when we close, is what are you gonna do? How are you gonna start working on your playbook? It's all up to you. Change is a choice, right? It's about human behavior. You have to think about it. Here's sort of a way to look at storytelling. When you share that personal experience, right? What if we take Fari, for example? If she said to us, ever since I was age five, I wanted to own my own business and I did a lemonade stand and I did a paper route and I sold magazines. Now I've got an idea that she's entrepreneurial and a sales-minded individual since she was age five. That's what I was looking for is to figure out what was that nugget, that kernel that started it all off. I'd actually, if we were working together, Fari, I'd want you to really dig in and we would reframe that whole experience of what made you want to start your own business. And that would be about 30 seconds to a minute of your three minute story. Because I want to feel that I know who you are as a business leader. Because almost always, why do most people switch? Why do most companies switch? Customer service, it's not price usually. If they're shopping for price and they pick you, most likely they're going to leave you because they're going to always be shopping for price. So a good story, you believe it, you feel it, and you act on it. A fabulous, a great story is one that has a message. And a message that lasts a lifetime is one that you get referrals. 
right? Ira sends a referral to my buddy Gigi, who said she was looking for an interpreter. Hey, you got to talk to Fari. Not only is she is a great person, great CEO, but she's got phenomenal team, great customer service. Boom. What am I doing? I'm sharing your elevator speech with a little bit of a personal fit because that's what a referral is, folks. It's an extension of your person and it becomes part of your intellectual property, right? And that becomes why people get referrals, right? When I first started out, any of you are just new, it's frustrating. I get it. I'm in my 19th year. I've got, you know, just an amazing history of set of successes. But you know what? In the back of my head, sometimes I wonder whether or not I chose the best path because those first couple of years were not fun. And COVID last year kicked my butt. Um, probably 50% of my uh, revenue is public speaking. And I normally do 45 public speaking events a year. Last year, I did 19. This year, I've already got eight or nine. So it's already a better year. What happened was the flip is consulting's gone up and coaching has gone way up because of referrals. So what are you doing to nurture that part of storytelling to make the connection? These are my suggestions. I think these will work for 80 to 90% of any of, of your given situation. So these are the six buckets. And Ira, you did get a question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Do you think it's a good idea to put any of these stories on our website? One billion percent, yes. On my website, I have, tw I think I'm up to about 22 success stories now. now the word narratives is often used as a synonym. So you can just use the word stories that cause us to pay attention, involve us. Dr. Bruner, so I highlighted, I covered up what the number is that his statistics, uh, his research has shown for the statistics. So what do you think in your head, what do you think the number is for how much more when we wrap a fact in a story? So this goes to the whole storytelling with data, which actually is a very popular uh, topic uh, for me as well. Because if you notice the phrase when people use it, it's storytelling with data. It's not data with stories. So what's the story you want to tell? What's the message you want to communicate? Then you share the facts. So the answer is 22. That's what his research shows. And the last one is a very, very powerful metaphor. I don't know if he realized this, Dr. Medina, that I believe this is a metaphor and really a human behavior issue. And it's not that you're boring. And I'm going to really point at you, right? I'm going to finger point at you and say, it's not that you're boring. It's that you're not communicating to your audience a problem that you're solving. Therefore, he or she is not feeling like you're inviting them in to your situation. So if you sound like a commercial, right? If I were to ask you to do your elevator speeches, which I believe is one of the most important parts of your system of credibility, it's going to sound like a commercial. How are you solving a problem and inviting me in? That's why. We don't pay, it to, pay attention to the boring things because you're not personalizing and customizing it. Pillar number five, every single day you're telling tons of stories. When we were first started, I don't know if you were on, Fari was talking to Gigi, a little bit of me, and we were communicating stories. You don't realize it, but you're telling stories all the time. Some have very, very low impact and some have very, very strategic impact, like the founder story that I was working on with Fari, huge significance. Right, I'm skipping number six, as I mentioned, I have a lot of them. All stories start as barbecue stories. And what I mean by a barbecue story is a fun, nice story. And what if I was there and you were talking to me, Aaron, let's imagine you and I had a barbecue, we're leaning on the, the, um, the railing and you're, I'm drinking soda because I'm driving and you can drink whatever you want. And you're telling me a story, I'm gonna be patient with you. Even for 10 minutes, I'm relaxed, relaxed. And Aaron's a nice person. So I'm enjoying the conversation. In business, it's three minutes approximately. So if you're a writer, meaning you like to write, that's about 450 words. As I mentioned, we speak approximately 150 to 175 words per minute. So business stories are barbecue stories with a purpose. Now, I wanna use this as an example. I was in, a, as I mentioned, in several countries. I'm in Tbilisi, Georgia. 
And one of the things I like to do, as you can tell by now, take lots of photos and demonstrate what I'm talking about through visuals, right? Hint, hint, wink, wink, nod, nod, leg stomp on the ground. These are the things that you guys should be doing. Showing pictures as much as you can of real things. If not, find stock photography that works. What is common here is headlines. Headlines, headlines, headlines. Worldwide, if you type in magazine, like if you were to type in Spain magazine, they're all the same. Sure, they're in a different language. So you want to think about this is your better tomorrow message. This is about five and a half words. And I did about research for about 4,000 magazine covers. My research showed the average uh, headline for each of the articles in a magazine is 5.5 words. So we say five and a half, six. That's where the better tomorrow message. That's your first statement out of your elevator speech, right? We, we do something. So let me illustrate this with a, a story. Michelle's five feet tall and it's important for the story. I'm doing a closing keynote for about 1,200 hospital healthcare professionals. Michelle happens to be a risk consultant. And I always do interviews before I do my presentations. And I always tell the person up front, hey, I'm going to interview you for about 15 minutes. Um, and thank you. I'm going to basically hang up on you and I'm polite about it. Right around 14 and a half, I'm going to wrap up and I'm off the call at 15 minutes. If you want to ask me any more questions, I'm happy to stay. But I want to thank you for that 15 minutes. Michelle, I'm interviewing her, asking her about her day. And at 14 minutes and 38 seconds, because I wrote it down, this is how powerful what she said to me is. I make a difference in patients' lives every day. I make a difference in patients' lives every day. Okay, I'm going to be New York blunt, boring, exciting. You want to know more. See, Michelle has the problem of being a finger pointer, a finger waggler. A patient has a bad experience. She gets a stack of folders or, receipt, or, or research. And she has to figure out, is it a people issue, a process issue, or a technology issue? Inevitably, it's a people issue. So this five feet petite woman walks down the hallway and, little, and six foot plus male doctors who normally fear nothing run like little tiny bugs when you turn the lights on. Why? Because no one wants to be on the other end of Michelle's finger, the finger waggler. So you want to move away from this and you want to find this. I call this buried treasure. So Fari was very nice to let me use her as my guinea pig as we did earlier. And notice how I was asking her questions to find this make a difference phrase, this better tomorrow message. That's the key to great storytelling, great messaging, great marketing, great sales. How do you keep people's exam uh, uh, attention? So I wanna show you two examples. So the first one is from Jeff Hoffman. This is a teaching story. So he uses this story to teach his consulting clients about how to think differently about innovation and creativity, right? What was in your mind, you don't need to put this in the, ch in the chat box, but in your mind, what's the better tomorrow message and call to action? So the answers are bring back childlike wonder and think like a five-year-old. Now, let's imagine I was your CEO and you were all on my leadership team. I want you all to think outside the box and on Monday, I want you to share new ideas, how we're going to be more creative and more successful, and more effective. Good luck. Go. As soon as you left the meeting, you would all be grumbling and rumbling going, what does he want? What is that? What, what, what is that? Think outside the box. What does that mean? Whereas if I tell the story that Jeff tells, and you didn't know this, that five-year-old was his daughter. And I met his daughter. She was there at the event. She actually went to GW. I think she was a sophomore at the time. She was able to see her dad speak, which was nice. And I got to ask her about the story. She goes, oh, yeah, it's definitely true. And I said to you, think like a child. Think like a five-year-old. Open your eyes. Now I'm giving you a call to action. Think like a five-year-old. And I'm connecting my message to your heart that makes it memorable. By gosh, by the time Monday shows up, you're going to be thinking and everybody's going to make a joke and go, hey, is it okay, Ira, that I thought like a seven-year-old, right? And people are going to laugh and you're going to allow the personality to come through. So that's a teach example of a teaching story that you might illustrate on how you do something. You know, I don't know who of you that does training or need to tell a teaching story. So if you're comfortable using a shortened bit URL, that's the bit.ly. If not, you can go to my website. It's active. You can do three a day. All right, so that tool is for you to use whenever you would like. I mentioned to you the eight success stories. 
this is something that I'm going to suggest in the action items for you is I personally, because your sales or business owners or both, is I would do a success story. Remember, I asked you to do that in the beginning. And then the who am I or the biography, sometimes that's the five and the six, like when Fari uh, offered to do her founder story. So I find that those are especially for you small business owners. The founder story is to me one of the most important stories because that tells people what the problem was and who you are as a leader and a person and why I should continue to build a relationship with you. Success stories, um, Alexis asked me that question earlier. You want to have that library up front. You had asked me about this. This is where I have it. It's on my blog. I have all sorts of stories on here. I'm always adding. I just added a new one. One of my clients um, is reading the culture map. Ira, you have a couple of questions here. Yeah, okay. One second, and then I'm happy to jump on it. So one of my clients, whoops, uh, there it is, culture map. And um, they read it to because they have an international organization. And the first uh, few words started off as a story. So I copied the story and put it on my blog as a great example of a cultural story, trying to understand other people's points of view. And it has nothing to do with culture in and of itself, the fact that it was two different countries. It's just the fact that we think differently. Go ahead, Alexis. Um, so the first question was, do you think it's better to put these stories in writing on our website or record video of them? I don't have any specific statistics that to tell you which one is better. What I do know is people are really, especially with COVID, loving video. So I'd actually say if you have the wherewithal, and that would be either budget and our time, to do both, at a minimum, do print. Print is so much easier because you can just edit it and there's no lighting that you need. There's nothing personal. You don't need a, a face or a voice or anything. But if you can get the customer to actually tell you the story, that would be the best. Um, and I, I would also add that, you know, having, making sure that you're, if you do use video, that it's accessible, you know, that you have captions, because um, a lot of people watch video without sound even. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, another question you received was, can anybody use this tool online or only those of us participating today? They have um, some other employees to, in their company to work through this. They would like anybody can use this around the world. There's, there's no, there's not, you see, the only difference is anybody that didn't come today, it's not going to make sense. Like what's a better tomorrow message? What's the call to action? Those things in and of itself don't stand by themselves. It's not designed to be self-explanatory. It's designed for people that did attend or one of my clients or something like that. And then you asked me this also, Alexis, where are my success stories? I've got a whole page on them and I'm always adding. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about better online experience from a point of view, not from the normal stuff like shoot your camera, make sure I don't see your brain, right? Mean, meaning your nose or uh, have the lighting to your right. You know, I don't want, that's not what I wanna challenge you. Remember my whole thing is about challenging you to think differently about how you engage. So your standard laptop does not have a high-end camera, especially if it's older. The go-to webcam, which is gonna be most likely better than most laptops, is your C920. I've had that, I don't even know how many years. It is now my backup because, because public speaking is so important to my business. I invested in the Brio 4K. Big, big difference in the quality of the video. So that's about, I think it's 199 retail. At one time on eBay around April, it was going for almost $600 because people were doing all, I mean, they just wanted a uh, web camera lighting. You can do your basic lamps. That's fine. But what do you do if you have to talk to somebody at night? Fari, you said you do 24 by seven. You might be talking to someone in another country, right? What do you get? You need lighting. So you can do things like a ring light. You can do super simple. You can buy a light kit. Then all of a sudden, when you start doing these things, you need room for these light stands and these light boxes, and it's going to end up taking up half your office. What I have is the Elgato key light. And you can look it up. I and I'm not a spokesman. I do not get any references. I love Elgato. And I use this key light up here. It's up to this area above. It is fabulous. I'm actually thinking about getting a second one because I'm going to start doing online training and doing like a LinkedIn learning or Udemy just for my stuff. And I want absolute perfect lighting. The, this El Elgato key light is a single stand that gets attached to the back of your desk. There is no um, footprint in the office that I have to worry about. It is behind my monitor. 
sound. Your laptop, no matter how expensive it is, is not going to be a great audio device. So inexpensive, now it might be out of your budget, but inexpensive, good mics. Elgato happens to have another. These are brand new devices within a year. I actually have the Blue Yeti professional mic, which is 250. I had that about six years ago and I still have it. And it's right above my head, off the desk, on a clamp arm with a, um, what do you call it? Um, a bounce, a, a device that prevents clicking and clacking. I forget what they call it. Um, it's all up here. So it's off my desk out of my space. I don't have to worry about banging into it. Green screen, another thing. It's going to occupy a huge amount of space. You can get a green screen kit on Amazon for 20 bucks. You can get a full kit with lights. But look at the space versus Elgato. And this is how I first got introduced to Elgato. This is the green screen that I'm using behind me. It's if you remember the old movie screens in classrooms that you pull down. In this case, you pull it up. It's six feet by about five inches wide, five inches high. And it's buried next to my shelves on my floor. And it's almost zero footprint in terms of the comparison. So whatever your budget is, and you're going to start doing, right? I, we have one of the masters of uh, online events with us, one of their fellow members that I met, I don't know how many months ago, Megan. If you have questions, there's a plug for her um, about online experiences. She's awesome. Um, when I first discovered this and knew this before I met her, I needed to make sure that my home studio, my office studio was awesome. So I invested in it and it was really important and it makes a difference. So another quick suggestion, um, especially for Zoom, this is one thing in Zoom. When I'm doing a Zoom meeting, a sales meeting, when you're, especially when you're screen sharing, you know how right now you have the video, uh, the pictures on the right, you can move the bar when you're the speaker. I move it to the middle so that my eye is at least focused in the middle. Because right now I'm looking on the right. So I have the slide. And the, and the pictures. So you want to do that. A couple of quick suggestions. I unplug my phone so it doesn't ring at all because mine has a battery such that it will actually start ringing and reminding me to plug it back in. Shut my door. My family knows when the door is shut, nobody knocks. I have seen people in their underwear and not even realize it. Yep, I've, there's one guy He's living with his in-laws and the mother-in-law walked in or them or his mother. And then the father came out of the shower and his face was straight on. And I, I almost fell out of my chair. I was dying. And not because I saw the man in his underwear, because he was so stoic. He was, I was just so unbelievably amazed. He, so it must be a regular occurrence for him. I've had dogs. I've had cats. I mean, just wherever you can try to minimize all that. We are so appreciative of it today. And actually it provides a little bit of levity, but if it's an important sales meeting, it's about creating that first impression and lasting. I have it when I call an adult sippy cup. So here's another personal thing about me. I love Godzilla. I bought this on eBay years ago and it has water, only drink water. Coffee creates a increased metabolism and heart rate actually makes you excited and you'll speak a little bit faster. You won't be relaxed. Tea actually makes you go to the, the uh, as I was saying to my 11 year old potty, so you don't want to drink tea. Water is actually the best lubricant for your mouth. Um, if you have your laptop or your screen, no one's going to know you put little notes around it. So if you don't remember all the stories, let's imagine um, you've got 10 different stories that you might want to tell, put little stickies. I get the Gigi story, the Fari story, the TJ story, the Alexa story, the Megan story, right? And then that's just enough to remind you, oh yeah, there we go. Stand if you can, right? Sitting down forces you to compress your diaphragm. It doesn't allow you to breathe normally and naturally. Also, I have to keep in mind when I'm doing my hand motion, I'm used to this now, I raise my hands. For most of you, if you look at the camera shot, it's about neck up. So your face, your smile, your eyes, and now your mouth, your words are more important than ever. And as I mentioned, share photos. If you notice in Jerry's, they were slightly blurry. Nobody cares as long as you're not giving someone a headache. So it's okay to use real photos, especially ones that you have of your elderly parents or where you grew up in a farm or something like that. Okay, so quick, some next steps. From today's audience, I'm gonna let Alexis pick. Any of you wanna be a volunteer, okay? You can email me and I'm gonna let the, the Montgomery County Chamber decide. They're the wonderful hosts. And I will, here's the thing if you volunteer, you have to be willing to do a before and an after, and I have to be able to share that with the group 
on the 28th are part two. So you can't just volunteer. You have to allow me to use you in the next webinar. And there I'm going to show you and I will work with you side by side on how to fix your narrative for your story. So whether it's a founder story, success story, and we'll do public speaking as well. I'm going to show you some wonderful examples of videos like JFK's um, at Rice University. We're going to the moon. It is phenomenal in terms of mastery of the voice and delivery. And I'm going to show you some examples of what these are Greek figures of speech. And I tell this to my students, my clients, whether you're consulting or coaching, you never have to remember what they are, but you have to remember how to apply them. For example, my, one of my favorites is Epizuxis, which is the fourth one down. I know you do this. You would say, this is really, really important. When you repeat the same word without any conjunctions in between, that's called Epizuxis. So anytime you say really, really, that's Epizuxis. I tell people when we're doing this to use it on purpose. And then you use it on purpose with public speaking and speaking enhancements so that you might say, ladies and gentlemen, this is really, really, really important. I can't stress to you how important this concept is for our future success. And nobody, unless they knew and they come to my webinar, are going to know that you purposely did three reallys. Because most people might say, oh, this is really important. No, do it three times. And that's where it comes to speaking enhancements. We're going to go through that. We're going to go deep. You're going to practice in breakout rooms. And so here's my big suggestions for you folks. Here's three. One for you personal, two for an organization. Start working on your stories. Do a messaging audit for your system of credibility. And then work on your sales playbook. So have personal stories and then organizational stories. Because no matter what, people want to connect with you on the heart. They want to know who you are as a person. So you want personal stories and business stories. And Maya Angelou says it the best. People will forget what you say. People will forget what you did. People will never, and I'm going to make this epizusis, never, 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 never forget how you make them feel. And now I will open it up to questions. Alexis, you decide who the questions are, please. And I'm happy to stay a few minutes afterward as well. Thank you always to my favorite chamber in the whole widest world. Well, there's nothing more powerful than a testimonial like that, Ira. Thank you. Uh, we're really excited everybody was here today. We really appreciate uh, this uh, fantastic um, session. And even better is that we're going to have a part two, which I'm really excited about. I just want you all to know, everybody on the call to know, is that I also work with Ira on this. And <laughs> it's, it's harder than it looks, but it is so worthwhile. It is really, really important. <laughs> <laughs> to take the time uh, to develop these stories, practice telling them, and really learn how to connect with other people uh, through the this kind of storytelling. Um, and you'll find out things about yourself you didn't know, too. I, I'd say this is better than therapy in many ways, Iris. <laughs> so, um... <laughs>